So we started two weeks ago talking about Jesus' bad day. And we're going to pick right back up where Jesus was having a bad day. And he didn't have a bad day in the sense that he did anything wrong because he never did. He didn't sin where you and I, when we have bad days, we sin. Um, sometimes a lot. And sometimes it doesn't take long. But he'd had a bad day. He had an argument with the Pharisees where he ultimately ended up um, telling them they probably would never believe because they accused him of working for Satan. He had done some miracles that day. His parents and brothers uh, or siblings had come to see him in a house and he was exhausted. Uh, but at the end of the day, he decided that he was going to teach and he was going to teach in a parable, which was a different teaching style than Jesus had been teaching in. We find ourselves in Matthew 13. It's called the parable of the soil, the parable of the sower. It is about salvation, the gospel and people receiving it for the first time. But it's also about understanding the word of God and hearing the truths in scripture and being able to apply them to your life. And so it applies to everyone. It's found this parable in three different places in scripture. It's found in the book of Mark chapter four in Luke uh, chapter eight, and also in Matthew chapter 13. It's a really important one. And Jesus even said that if you don't understand this parable, you're really not gonna understand the rest. And so we're gonna talk about it today just for the first 10 minutes or so. And then I'm gonna move to Hebrews chapter five. And you and I are gonna talk about the condition of our hearts because you may have come in today um, with a distant heart, with a hard heart, with a heavy heart, with a broken heart, or maybe some with an attentive heart. Whatever the condition of your heart, that's what we're gonna discuss today as we spend the rest of our time together in Hebrews chapter five. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and he sat by the lake and such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and he sat in it while well, all the people stood on the shore. And then he told them many things in parables, saying a farmer went out to sow his seed. Now, farmers um, in Iowa, you, you guys kind of get it if you've been around Iowa for any period of time. I didn't get it. When I first moved here, actually before I even moved here, I stayed in a hotel. We were coming up here to interview and the hotel was a decent hotel, but on the wall, it had a picture of a cornfield. And my thought was, as a person never having been to Iowa, why in the world would Iowa put their worst foot forward instead of their best foot forward? Because corn to me just seemed like something you drive through or fly over. And when I got to, to church, one of the people just was being nice and they said, hey, how was your hotel? And I said, great, you know, it was comfortable, but it really strange. They had a picture of corn on the walls and they said, oh, you don't, you don't understand. In Iowa, that's not just corn, that's money. He said, every one of those corn stalks looks like a hundred dollar bill to a farmer. And it made sense to me. And that's kind of the reason Jesus used this illustration or this parable, which is a made up story to go along with a really important spiritual point to teach uh, us how it is that we should live because they knew agriculture and they understood that their economy turned based on the seasons and the production of their crop. Let's move on with the story. A farmer went out to sow his seed and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Let's keep moving. Other seed fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And so Jesus basically says, there's a story about a farmer and he was scattering seed. And the way that you scattered seed back in this day was that you broadcast it, not with machinery, but with your hand. So they would have a big bag of seed that they would wear slung over their shoulder. They had a hole in the top of the bag. They would stick their hand in the bag and they would walk rows that were carefully crafted by hand to be as straight as they possibly could be. And they would throw the seed back and forth and they got so good at it that it was almost as uh, like clockwork, like machinery. But inevitably, some of the seed would fall in places that were not intended for it to fall. For example, the beaten path. 
all of the fields had to have paths that were cut through them so that people could pass uh, from one place to the other without having to go unreasonable distances. The paths were about three feet wide that originally were just farm soil, but had been trodden down by people's feet, by traffic. In Matthew chapter nine, Jesus said that he looked out and he saw in the fields people coming and he looked at them and moved with compassion. They were harassed and helpless and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd and likely they were walking up these three foot paths and lines uh, coming through these crops and Jesus was able to see them all. And so uh, the paths were a type of soil and you didn't want to cast seed on the path because it certainly was not receptive to, to seed, but inevitable just the same. There was a second type of soil that um, Jesus was talking about. And he said it was a rocky soil. Now in the rocky soil, the soil wasn't filled with rocks because any good farmer would remove the rocks. The soil had sometimes in Palestine, limestone rivers that ran underground and they weren't consistent to the level of the soil. And so sometimes they would be very close to the surface and sometimes they would be very deep. And when the seeds were sown over the rocks, they would try to go down and dig deep roots. They would shoot up quickly and look like the best crop, but they would hit the limestone rock and not be able to grow. The third type of soil was even a little bit harder to distinguish, and it was the weedy soil. Do any of you have gardens in here or do any gardening or landscaping? Are you green thumb people? Anyone? Right? Raise your hands. My wife is the green thumber the landscaper and the gardener, and um, she pulls weeds and she hates weeds. And you may hate weeds too, but the problem with weeds is that you pull them and it's hard to know if you got the whole weed. You try to pull them by the roots and you can't get the roots up sometimes. And as much as you can tell, the weeds are gone, but without chemicals, it's impossible to know for sure. So there was some soil that had weeds in it and you didn't know and the, the plants would start to grow and the weeds would choke out the plant it would strangle them. And so Jesus was talking about three types of soil that the people would know well, and it was an inevitability of farming or agricultural life. And so everyone was tracking and nodding their head. And after he told this short little story, he stopped and he said, do you know what I'm talking about? Now, most people would understand that story. Yes, I know what you're talking about. But Jesus was kind of the wink, wink, do you know what I'm talking about, right? Not, not the story on the surface, but are you tracking with the story below the surface? Not do you hear what I'm saying, but do you get what I mean? You know what I'm saying? But do you get what I mean? Yeah, right? And so the disciples were nodding their heads, even though they probably didn't really understand that well. And so I'm gonna kind of give you a little jump toward the interpretation um, just to kind of help with today's teaching. But the sower was Jesus who brought the word. And it looks like it's just the gospel, but Matthew, in Matthew 13, but in Mark chapter four, it tells us that it's the word of God, that it's the teachings of God. And Jesus came to this earth and began to spread the seed of the kingdom of God and the word of God, the gospel. And it fell on different types of soil. The seed is the word. The sower is Jesus who passed it on to the apostles who in turn passed it on to all of us with the word, but the soil, this is the key to the parable. The soil is all about the heart. The soil is the heart of the individual hearing the message. What is the condition of your heart? Is it hard like the beaten path, the circumstances of life, the attrition of time? Has your heart become hardened, over-trafficked, burned out? Is your heart superficial that when tough things come, depth, hard decisions, you find that the rocks below the surface prohibit any growth. Is your heart full of weeds, concerns and cares? Is it heavy? Does it strangle out the truths of God, the 
come to us from the pages of scripture. And Jesus stops and he said, for those who have ears, if you can hear it, hear it. And I'm gonna explain it to you. But he pauses and everyone is left there examining the condition of their heart. So let's you and I examine the conditions of our heart. Today, you may have come in with a heavy heart. You may have come in with a rocky heart. You may have come in with a weedy heart. And today, God can make that soft. And so I wanna pray for you because we're gonna be discussing it in some detail in just a few minutes. And I want us to be on the same page, heading the same direction so that you and I can apply the same truths to our life. But let me tell you right now, you can't apply these yourself. You have to have help. And so I'm gonna ask God to, to empower, to allow his Holy Spirit to speak in our lives in such a way where there's no mistake what he's doing and there's no chance you and I can't walk out of here unchanged. As you all know well by now, we have a granddaughter, Joy and I, named Emery Lorraine, and she is 16 months old, and we like her. Um, matter of fact, we love her, and we get to watch her almost every day um, on FaceTime grow up. Now, it's certainly not the same thing as being there in person, but it's a lot better than when my boys were young and they're 24 and 27, I think. And um, when they were little, they had to go by phone to talk to my parents and they hated talking on the phone. They still hate talking on the phone. My boys probably uh, would rather text than talk. And oftentimes they don't even text back and I have to, to text them and say, hey, are you dead? Because they just forgot. And um, I have one son who just nods his head or shakes his head and the other one, I just don't think checks his phone. Now, that was tough, but we get to FaceTime Emery and Emery is hilarious at 16 months old. And we FaceTime her and she'll say words like hi. And I say, say grandpa. And she'll say bapo because that's what she calls me. And she's starting to say grandma and she's starting to say outside and starting to say happy and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we watch her eat because she's strapped in a high chair and that's, you know, she's stationary. If not, she grabs the phone and runs through the house and we have like FaceTime Emory cam and it's really crazy. It makes you a little seasick. But we were um, FaceTiming her a couple days ago and she was filthy. And right after school, she goes to, to daycare a couple days a week. She was dirty. And um, we said, what in the world happened to Emory? Did she go to the park? And Eden said, no, um, she was uh, planting today in, in daycare. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, she had, they gave them dirt and they gave them seeds and they gave them a mason jar and they gave them a, you know, a, and they, were, they were planting, like putting the, and, and I said, that's amazing. And I said, well, did she enjoy it? And Emery said, I know she enjoyed it. Look at her, but she ate a lot of dirt. And that's what Emery said. Now, when you're 16 months old, you're supposed to eat dirt. That's what you do. If you're 18 and you're still eating dirt, there's a problem, isn't there? When you're a baby, you'll put anything in your mouth that you can find. But as you grow, you learn to be discerning or you can't fit in your church pants or the doctor tells you to cut it out, right? I mean, we have to, to grow in our discernment and our understanding. I want you to keep that in mind. Both listen to what I said and, and listen to what I mean as we look at Hebrews chapter five, because the author of Hebrews is talking to Jews who some of whom or many of whom have received Christ, but had regressed away from a relationship with Jesus back toward uh, a love of legalism. And then some of them probably weren't saved yet at all, but there was a problem with depth. And the author was confronting them on being spiritually babies and, and putting anything in their mouths. So let's look at this together. There's much more we would like to say about this, but it's difficult to explain. And he was talking about Jesus being the new high priest and comparing him to Melchizedek. It's difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. Now that's not a very polite way to start a, a, an interaction with somebody. You are spiritually dull and you don't seem to listen. But sometimes it represents us as people and sometimes it represents you and me when we sit under the teaching or around the teaching or listen to the teaching or read the teaching of the word of God. And the word dull here is really interesting. Are you ready for this? The word dull is a compound word. And the author of Hebrews is saying, you are spiritually dull. 
And the word dull, when I was researching this and investigating this, it just came alive in my spirit and convicted me as well as encouraged me. The word dull, when he says you're spiritually dull and don't even seem to listen, it means literally dull, a compound Greek word, no pull. There is nothing in you that seems to pull you towards the deeper truths in scripture. There's just nothing there. You're disinterested. You're flat. You've disengaged. There's no desire. And that's a warning sign. It's a full on alarm bell going off that something's wrong and something has to change. You've been believers for so long now that you ought to be able to teach others, but instead you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's word. You're like babies who eat dirt or need milk, right? And cannot even eat solid food. Three things that we're told, spiritual babies, the characteristics of them. First of all, they can't teach. And it doesn't mean they don't know. Many spiritual babies know lots. They can quote scripture all day long. They can throw a verse at you, no matter what your circumstances. They may be the kind of person when you're going through the worst possible circumstances in life, slaps you with some kind of a trivial answer that represents a Bible verse that wounds you more than it helps you. Um, sometimes these spiritual babies who should be able to teach are chock full of information, but there's just no application in depth. Sometimes these spiritual babies that should be able to teach all the time ask for depth. But what they want is information and detail and fact, but yet Jesus continued to say depth comes from understanding and from doing. That they crave spiritual milk, which spiritual milk are the superficial, not unimportant, but the tertiary, the first kinds of things we learn as Christians. The gospel, very, very important. But then all of the things that sort of add to our lives, the happy promises of God, the kinds of stuff that makes me happier and better, and oftentimes is, is all about me, my life. Almost like we turn God into um, a magic lamp and a genie or a vending machine. We get it wrong. We just like the easy stuff. And the result of that is the inability to discern truth from error. James talks about being tossed around without any ability to navigate in the middle of a storm. That when you hear spiritual truth, when you hear teaching, when you read scripture, when you hear someone's opinion, you don't know if it's right or wrong. You are just at the whim of your own judgment and options and history and worst of all, emotion. And the analogy that the author of Hebrews is using is the analogy of training. And he talks about a mature person. And he says a mature person is able to teach. And that doesn't mean chock full of information because it's not about information. It means that he has received or she has received the information and has applied it. The words that, used are, that are used here is not even the process of training, but it's the result of a life of training that ends up with something that we would call true depth because someone has taken the difficult truths in scripture and applied them over time in their lives and lives a different way. Now, let me give you a comparison of the, the spiritual baby and the, the spiritual adult or grown up. I had a friend once when my boys were young who was a parenting expert he told us all about how to be a great parent. He told us how to discipline. He told us what the value should be for our kids, told us how we should run our household. I mean, he had all of the answers. He'd read James Dobson. He'd been well-versed. He'd been to seminars. You know what the problem was? He didn't have any kids. And he was the expert on parenting and had never had kids. And you and I both know there's no book, no seminar. There's no amount of preparation that can prepare you to be a good parent. You do that by hitting your knees and saying, Jesus, help me. And then over time, with God's help and probably a little luck, your kids, you know, you're like, thank you, God. You allowed me to, to parent. And when you want advice from somebody on parenting, you look at somebody who's done it and applied it over time. 
I knew a man who loved to give marriage counseling advice. And he'd been married a long time, but by all accounts had a miserable marriage. Was mean to his wife. Had a loveless relationship. But was very quick to tell you what you should do and how you should interact with your spouse. Quick to teach, unable to teach. Living his life in the spiritual shallows. Eating dirt. Unable to even determine the basics of right and wrong. But the person who desires the depth of scripture, the meat, and the meat are the things that relate to moral decisions, to ethical decisions, to financial decisions, to relationship decisions, to career decisions, how we live, our relationships, what we say about each other, our view of the church. When we embrace the depths then apply these things over time. Get humbled time and time again. Broken, fall down, get back up, fall down again, get back up. And then you know what? Fall down again and get back up. Over time, truth embraced, truth applied becomes truth lived and your life becomes something useful to the Lord. But the heart has to be soft and you have to be able to receive it. And the passage in Hebrews 5 says, some people never move to the depths at all. But it also insinuates and implies, even in a stronger way, that many people probably just regressed back from their spiritual progress and just decided that life lived in the shallows was enough. No pull. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing to be said about your life at the end of your life? They just had no pull. Spiritually to be described as someone with no pull. And Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 13 and Mark chapter four and in Luke chapter eight, reasons why our hearts might not be receptive to the truth. Roadblocks for us to progress along the growth continuum, things that may steal these truths. Satan, history, circumstances, and priorities, but today I wanna make sure that you have pull, that you sense the Holy Spirit in your life pulling you towards the deeper things in scripture, not just information, but the application of difficult things that cause us to die to self. Now. I want to read to you a passage of scripture where the apostle Paul talks about this. And I want to try to apply this in very quickly, just a few ways. The apostle Paul is begging us in Romans chapter 12. And this is a passage, if you've been paying attention, that I've used about three or four times in the last six weeks. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world because the world's got a plan for you. Friends, I don't know any clearer way to say it. You can win in this world and you can be a loser at God. You can lose everything as far as God is concerned. And you can win everything as far as this world is concerned. And when you leave this world, you'll be marked with no pull. And everything that you have gathered stays here and is given to someone else, distributed or dies. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. We think the wrong way. Just like Jesus was saying, do you hear what I'm saying? Yeah, but do you know what I mean? Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I have an uncle, I've told you about him before. His name's Ray, my dad's brother. Um, Not that much older than me. Um, I always kind of looked at him like an older brother instead of an uncle. 
And he had a career that was kind of cool. He started off as a sports writer and he wrote for the Birmingham Post in Alabama, um, covered the Crimson Tide, whether you like him or hate him, that was his life for a long time. And he was a, an Alabama guy. Um, I always thought he was the coolest guy because um, when I was a kid, he always missed holidays. And the reason is because bowl games happen on holidays and Alabama was good enough to be in the bowl games. And it wasn't that I wanted to miss holidays, it's that Ray had an MGB convertible and um, he had a cool dog and he got to go to games and sit in the press box and got to write articles and he ended up with a syndicated AP press. He's been on ESPN. I was in the gym the other day and I was looking at ESPN too and I looked up and I'm like, that's my uncle right there talking. But papers died right at some point and his job sort of disappeared and he didn't know what he was gonna do next. And so he ended up becoming the director of public relations for BP right after the oil spill. And you talk about somebody thrown into the fire and he did that for a while. And then God moved him and he did something else for a big timber company and then ended up as the chief of staff. And I'm probably getting the title wrong for a congressman in Alabama. And we were sitting at a wedding not too long ago. And, and I was talking to him and I, I was, Ray I said, tell me how in the world you got to, from where you were to where you are right now, because you're talking about sports writer, MGB convertible, being in the press box on the weekends to BP and everybody hating your guts because BP ruined the oceans. And then all of a sudden, and then all of a sudden, but your life has been amazing. And he said, Rick, it's been really simple. And I leaned in because I like this guy and respect him. We're sitting at a table watching everybody dance badly, as I remember correctly easy to judge when you're sitting on the side watching. I leaned in and he said, Rick, God has only given me the gift of one choice at a time. He said, one option is what I had at each, each turn in my life. And friends, the problem is we Christians, we have too many options in our life. There are too many things you think you can turn to besides the truths in the word of God. And everything except the depths, the deep truths found in the word will shipwreck your life. And you may win according to the world standards, but you'll be stamped with no pull when you leave this world behind. Man, we don't want that. It scares me to death. And so I have just a couple things I want to leave you with because we're almost finished. And these things I think are important. They're things that I do. They're ways to soften your heart. Because if you have been pursuing Christ and found yourself sort of falling back or maybe never really moved into the depths in the first place, the good news is not only does Jesus say, but the writer of Hebrews implies that, that you can grow, that I can grow, that we can become these kinds of people. But when you encounter the word of God, and if you love God, you have to love the word because that's the way God expressed himself to us, his primary way. When you encounter the word of God and decide whether or not you're going to embrace and apply, I think there is at least a process or some steps that maybe you should take. Maybe you encounter the word all the time. For a lot of people, this is the only time you encounter the word all week long. So I'm just gonna talk about it for church purposes. You come here, we scatter the word. There are people who are far more skilled than I in scattering the seed and make sure it doesn't hit any of the wrong places, but I scatter it as best I can. You, as you come, the condition of your heart, between you and the Lord, what you apply, and it takes, well, there's a process. I just wanna share it with you real quickly. They all start with P because sometimes it's fun just to alliterate. First of all, you have to prioritize. Hearing the word has to be a priority and doing the word. And I feel like one of the most, one of the easiest ways to make sure that you don't grow, one of the, um, I think maybe one of the most subtle, slippery ways that you don't grow is by choosing not to make this a priority in your life. 
And unless you plan to make encountering the word of God and other people, other Christians, a priority in your life, the world has other plans and they all seem urgent, but none of them are as important. And this is a time when I'd say, do you hear what I'm saying? And you'd say, yes. And then I would say, do you know what I mean? And some of you would say, yeah, I hear what you're saying, but I don't really get what you mean. Or I don't care what you mean. Or you don't live in my world. Or you don't know my schedule. So what I would ask you is, what is more important than you developing pull in your life? And if you don't make something as simple as this a priority, I wonder. The second thing is there's a preparation that's involved. Now, I love this. Even before I read the word and when I study when I listen to sermons, I love to listen to sermons. When I do cardio, I go out and walk and sometimes put a weight vest on. I find a good sermon and kind of nerd out listening to somebody. I always pray and I say, God, my mind's distracted. I need you to teach me what you want to teach me. I even pray if this is not the right person for me to listen to, just give me a little check in my spirit so that I head a different direction. I, I, I prepare because if I don't, a lot of times I'll read the word and it's just words or I hear something and it's just, you know, it doesn't, doesn't penetrate. It doesn't penetrate. When Joy and I, when we drive to church every morning, we prepare. Now I'm prepared before I drive to church. Don't get me wrong. The sermon's in the can, right? But we prepare our hearts and we pray. And usually Joy prays out loud because she's much better prayer than me. And she prays for each of us. God, prepare our hearts. Use us today. And when we pray for you guys, Bring the people here you want here, Father. The ones who you don't want here, have them go somewhere else, Father. When we're here, make sure we're others focused. Make sure nothing gets in the way of people meeting with you. Do something amazing in the lives of our friends, Father, we pray. And there's a couple reasons why we do that. One is because we're super spiritual and that's what, I'm just kidding. We're not that spiritual. I mean, we try to be, but sometimes morning by morning, it varies. Your mileage may vary too. There's a reason for that. Because when you're getting ready to do something that is gonna help you move into the depths, you have an enemy who prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Do you know that sometimes you end up in fights on Sunday morning? Did you know that? With a spouse? Have you ever had that happen? Have your kids ever just gone nuts on Sunday morning and, and they don't even do that normally and you're like, oh, we can't go to church today. Our kids are crazy. Um, Joy and I sometimes fight on Sunday mornings. I mean, we fight, we don't fight, but I mean, you know, we can get snippy. I'm like, here we are going to worship Jesus and we're, and we're, and so we pray. One of it's just to prevent idiocy, right? We know, we know where we're going to go because there's a pull in us that wants to keep us in the shallows. And so we pray and prepare and you should do the same thing. You may not think you need to be here, but there's somebody here who needs you here. And I want to tell you a secret, and I love you. That's just why I want to tell you, because it's just you and I having a conversation. It's not all about you. God has chosen you to be Jesus in the lives of the people who are around you. Because Jesus isn't here in bodily form. You are. And I believe that preparation is one of the things we should do to soften our hearts and to grow a little further into the depths. Participation is important. And one of the things that participation involves is putting aside distractions. So that's what this looks like. In your own private life, if you're having devotions, if you're reading something, if you're listening to something, you gotta make sure nothing in crowds, you know, uh, competes for your attention. For me, two headphones usually does it. If I put two headphones in, it usually takes care of it. Um, in church, when you come, you have to decide if you're going to allow distractions to keep you divided from the word or if you're going to eliminate distractions. And for some of you, it means you got to put up your cell phones. Now, I don't know who you are because I can't see. So don't think I'm talking to anybody. I just know people. Texts go off. I'm the worst. I mean, I have this, this innate urge to grab my phone and check and I'm not that important. There's nobody who needs me that bad, but yet there's this desire and there's news that happens during church and I can't possibly miss it when notifications go off. And, and I used to have this friend in Seattle and he was a cowboy fan, just like I was. M. Ish, ish, cowboy fan, ish. 
we're almost done. He would sit right there where you are and he would have an earpiece in. And the cowboys in a different time zone would sometimes play during church. And he would be looking at his phone. His name was Jeff. If Jeff's watching, I'm calling him out. And I'd ask him after church, I'd say, Jeff, are you watching the Cowboys or are you looking at your Bible? Because your Bible's on the phone too, right? And your notes and your app. I'm not judging if I see you with your phone. I'm seeing you and God. But there are also a lot of other things like Facebook, which can wait, by the way. And he just flat out told me, he said, Rick, I'm paying attention every other Sunday, but when the Cowboys are playing, uh uh-uh. I got one ear on the game and one ear on you. The divided heart. He was a great guy. I just didn't understand, right? At least he was honest. You have to eliminate distractions from your life and you know what that looks like because you know you, all right? And then we have to commit to practice. We have to commit to practice what we hear. And this is the, this is the hardest because you'll hear something, maybe even right now, the Holy Spirit, not Rick, the Holy Spirit has convicted you and you've heard something and you know, I need to do something. I need to be something. I need to change. You can't do it on your own. The Holy Spirit of God gives you the strength to follow through. But as you will see next week, Satan himself never misses a church service. And he steals away the desire that you have to apply the word of God in as crafty and cold-hearted ways as he possibly can. And if you don't act with conviction and urgency, the desire that you have to move away from the shallows and into the depths, to determine your purpose, to find meaning, to get to the end of your life and not hear the words, no pull. He'll steal that before you hit the parking lot. So next week, we're going to talk about that. We're really going to dig into the parable and you aren't going to want to miss it. But I want to pray for you that you'll have a soft heart. And when you come next week, let's look at these things. Maybe you can do these things. And let's see what effect it has on us and on the people around us. Father, thank you for my friends who are here and I pray that you would pinpoint truth in our lives. We are just people. I'm just a person. I've scattered the seed as best I can, Father. I have prayed and prepared, but I am inadequate to do anything really good spiritually. Your Holy Spirit takes your word and does amazing things. You tell us it never goes out and returns back void without accomplishing your purpose. And I know you have a purpose in us today and through us and we're here and there's no accident in that. And I pray, Father, that that my friends and I, if we find ourselves having never really moved beyond the superficial trivialities of turning our Bible into a greeting card. That we would leave the shallows, quit eating dirt, move toward the meat. If we've regressed for some reason, Father, back into a state of no pull, I pray your Holy Spirit would begin to pull in an unmistakable way. As Paul says in Romans 12, that we would embrace the current of the Holy Spirit as you transform us into a new person by changing everything about our lives. And I pray, Father, that as we unpack this parable and others, that you would continue to instruct and motivate, adjust, transform, lead us to freedom and allow people to see you in our lives and nothing else. That we can become people who have lived the lives that give us the opportunity to teach the truth applied over time, the result of letting you be Lord in our lives. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.